Hello, welcome to the self learning platform by Dr. Shishma Singh. Today we start Unit 2 Constitutionalism BNA Act of 1867, Constitutional Act of 1982, Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Now, introduction about the unit. Canada is an independent self-governing democracy. Canada is ruled by the principles of constitutionalism, which means the absolute supremacy or predominance of regular law as opposed to the influence of arbitrary power. As Desi points out, it also means equality before the law or the equal subjection of all classes to the ordinary law of the land. Constitutional rule forms the cornerstone of liberal democracy. It means regulating the state's power over its citizens. Another role of constitution also is to set the structure of government. Canada being a liberal democracy is governed by the principle of rule of law. Its form of government is a constitutional monarchy. It is a federal state and parliamentary government with two official languages and two systems of law, civil law and common law. The present constitution of Canada was initially a British statute. The British North American Act 1867 BNA Act and until 1982, its amendment required action by the British Parliament. Since 1982, when the constitution was patriated, that is when Canadians obtained the right to amend the constitution in Canada, this founding status has been known as the Constitution Act 1867. This act of 1867 was culmination of British legislation enacted from time to time for the governance of British North American colonies. It has also been developing further through processes of amendments, judicial decisions and establishment of some conventions. The next step is evolution of the constitution. Like many other constitutions, Canada con constitution is not a single document. It is made up of the statutes enacted by the British and Canadian parliaments as well as legislation, judicial decisions and amendments between the federal and provincial governments. It also includes unwritten elements such as British constitutional conventions, established customs, traditions, and precedents. The Constitution's basic written foundations are the Constitution Act 1867, which created the Federal and Constitutional Act 1982 which entrenched a Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and Procedures for Constitutional Amendments. These documents, however, are not creation of particular years of enactment. They rather reflect the culmination of a long process of evolution. Now let us discuss developments up to 1867. As per government to Canada, 
Pervy Council records formal constitutional development in Canada began with the addict creation the Sovereign Council of Quebec in 1663, whereby the French established New France as a royal province and made provision for civil government following a transfer of Canada to British rule. The Royal Proclamation of 1763 established among other things, certain principles respecting civil government in Quebec and relations with aboriginal peoples. Canada was to be ruled by a governor general on behalf of the King of Great Britain. In the years immediately preceding the American Revolution, the British government became increasingly engaged in the question of how to maintain the loyalty of its new Canadian subjects. Mindful of the significant cultural differences between the Quebec and the rest of Britain, North America, the Westminster Parliament passed the Quebec Act 1774 authorizing the use of French civil law and permitting the free exercise of the Roman Catholic religion. The act is the original legal source of Quebec's subsequent position affirming its continuing recognition as a distinct society in North America. Following the American Revolution and the in flux of many loyalist and constitutional act 1791 divided Quebec into two provinces upper and lower Canada each with an elected assembly the elected assemblies permitted Canadians to enjoy representative government for the first time and to control the imposition of new taxes. However, the executive branch of government was not accountable for its policies, programs, and activities to the elected assembly. He received instructions from the colonial office in London. This lack of accountability led in time to strong dissatisfaction among the elected leaders. In 1837-38, there were revolts in the upper and lower Canada, reflecting on the one hand English-French differences and on the other demands for a system of responsible government. To deal with the situation, the constitutional government was suspended and Lord Durham was sent to Canada to inquire into the situation and make recommendations. The Durham report made two key recommendations. First, the upper and lower Canada be joined in a single legislative union. The use of French be proscribed and the assimilation of the Francophone population by the Anglophone population be fostered. Second, that responsible government be established. Consequent to Durham report, the Unite Union Act of 1840 allowed the Governor General of the Upper and Lower Canada to proclaim that they be joined under the name of the Province of Canada. The Act provided for an institutional structure similar to that of all of the British North American colonies, namely a Governor, an Executive Council, an appointed legislative council and an elected assembly. 
the original assembly had 42 members from canada east and canada west being increased to 65 each in 1853 Although Upper and Lower Canada had been legally abolished, continuing recognition had to be given to the fact that culturally and sociologically the old provinces still remained within the new institutional structure. Although the Union Act had not provided for responsible government, this objective was achieved during the next seven years under Canada's unwritten constitution. The traditions, customs, practices, and legislation of greater or less importance. Now we are going to discuss towards confederations. With the establishment of some form of parliamentary government, but not stably in the region, there were both aspirations and needs for change. Ronald L. Chapin suggests that series of economic, psychological, social, and political factors begin to force residents of the British North American colonies to consider some form of larger political unit. The presence of United States has always been a factor with respect to Canada. Just south of this handful of sparsely populated and geographically very separated British colonies was a rapidly expanding nation increasingly bent on the economic and territorial expansion. The thin red line of British control from the province of Canada to the most remote colonies of Vancouver, Iceland, established in 1849, was maintained essentially by granting control of the intervening territory to the Hudson's Bay Company. This land would undoubtedly be increasingly coveted by the rapid westward movement of the American settlers. The British North American co colonies had a myriad of other problems. The repel of the British corn laws in 1846 and the resultant move towards free trade undermined the protected market in Britain for Canadian goods. Britain was pulling back from the idea of an imperial economic union and was moving in the direction of free trade. All of the British colonies had to seek other outlets for their products rather than merely relying on Great Britain. It was therefore logical to turn towards the United States. As a result, in 1854, a reciprocity treaty was signed between the United States and no British North America just prior to confederations. However, the United States withdrew from the reciprocity treaty, thus emphasizing the need for a wider British North American market to replace the already lost trade with the United Kingdom. There is no doubt that the province of Canada with its slowly developing industrial base, felt that it needed some kind of hinterland as a market for its goods. The province of Canada was looking both to the east and to the west. By the late 1850 and early 1860s, 
the feeling was growing that the western region of what is now canada would soon have to be settled or they would be lost to united states between 1864 and 1867 political leaders from the province of canada and the atlantic provinces met in charlotte town quebec city and finally in london to examine the possibility of creating a new federal union and to propose the terms on which the new federation would be based on october 10 1864 assembled at quebec 33 representatives 12 from canada 7 each from new brunswick and prince edward island 5 from nova scotia and 2 from new foundland the fundamental principle earlier accepted at charlotte town was that the new union should be a federation in less than 18 days 72 resolutions were agreed on these resolutions were approved by the parliament of canada but met considerable opposition in the maritime provinces this led to the convening of a conference by the british government in london consisting of the representatives of the nova scotia new brunswick and canada ultimately the terms for the creation of the new federation were agreed upon thus the stage was set for the british north american act 1867 b and a act this act was an act of the british parliament passed on march 29 1867 and which was proclaimed on may 22 and came into effect on july 1 1867 it created the dominion of canada and set out its constitution by laying out the structure of the government of canada and listing the division of powers between the federal government and the provincial government here we want to wind up this lecture and thank you so much for your attention